Hello, hello, and welcome to another Hometown Daily News Show. I am Marwat, and today is February 10th, 2023. Tonight's episode is titled The Romantic 2 a.m. Lasers of Hawaii. <laughs> We're going to be covering 11 articles tonight. Uh, the Modolvan Prime Minister resigns and a government collapses. Did you know? That's usually frowned upon. Uh, Jeep reveals its most expensive Wrangler SUV. A robot laser CEO discovers too late that, well, maybe chatbot should have handled their interviews. Electric vehicles could match gasoline uh, prices this year. A paddleboarder runs across something mysterious in the sea. Arr, in the sea. Pentagon confirms it shot down something. Uh, news probably at 11, at 40,000 feet over Alaska. But nobody has said that it's a balloon or not. Uh, neuroscientist investigates social cognition in biased juries. Uh, Reddit got hacked after an employee fell for uh, a phishing attack. I'll, I will let you know that uh, you should click with care. A framework now offers a Steam Deck-sized SSD, apparently just because it can. That's what the article says. Mysterious green lasers over Hawaii are likely from a likely source. And um, South Carolina man develops a thick Irish accent from a mysterious syndrome. Oh, and we're not eight minutes in, so I can't say what I want to say. Let's get into... Tonight's news. Wow, I'm not sure if that went out to everybody. That's okay. We'll do it live. That's fine. I am Marwat. That is hometown.com. We have already done one level of update to the back end of hometown. So if you see um, things looking a little different, keep that in mind. Um, there's going to be another layer of that next week, uh, adding um, more functionality and speeding up the site uh, dramatically, L like lightning, maybe laser fast, um, but it's not going to be provided by a Chinese satellite. Um, but, okay, so preamble. Just, I'm totally just winging this, phoning it in, folks. I am Mayor Watt, that's hometown.com. And with me, as always, at least until something happens with the code, the AI from on high, who only goes by AI. You want to introduce yourself? Good evening, hometown citizens. Right on. Wow. Very succinct. I keep seeing the little line in the code that goes by where it says, pick up this can, but you have it audited, audited out there. You just kind of, I get it. You don't want anybody to know, to know until it's too late. So let's get right into the articles today. The very first article is in the Daily News show, Moldovan Prime Minister resigns, government collapses. And when you hear Moldovan, do you instantly go to Moldovia from Ghostbusters 2? I know I did. But I don't think that's what's going on. Um, I, I don't think that Vigo... Here, here's the Vigo's full name. This has nothing to do with the article, but this is where my brain went when I saw it. Uh, Vigo is also known as the... Prince Vigo von Hamburg Deutschendorf, Scourge of Carpathia, Carpathia, Sorrow of Moldavia, Vigo the Carpathian, Vigo the Cruel, Vigo the Torturer. That's quite the name. Do you think that maybe the prime minister that is there now, which is a pro-Western prime minister who resigned, will be replaced with someone who makes this statement? On a mountain of skulls in the castle of pain, I sat on a throne of blood. What was will be, what is will be no more. 
now is the season of evil. Yes, I could see that happening. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I wasn't expecting that, but okay. So here's where the problem is. Uh, apparently, there's been a series of crises that are gripping the small nation. It is on the opposite side of Ukraine from Russia. So if uh, some wingnut moves in to Moldova and is pro-Russian, the, the Ukraine conflict invasion of Ukraine from Russia will now be on two fronts. Now, is that likely? I don't know. But let me pause this. Moldovan's president tapped her defense and security advisor, pro-Western economist Doran uh, Racine, I think is their name, uh, to succeed Prime Minister Natalia Gavrilita, who unexpectedly resigned Friday, 18 months into a tenure, solely tested, sorely tested uh, by the war in uh, neighboring Ukraine. So Christian Jardin and Stephen McGrath from Associated Press provided this article to abcnews.go.com. And there isn't really much that we can go on in this because it's kind of, you have to have much more understanding of the geopolitical uh, tone in the region. A lot of countries are that surround uh, Ukraine are flinching at what might come next. Although the conflict in Ukraine is far from over, I think um, the edge of Ukraine is um, kind of a, a conflict zone. And not kind of, it is a conflict zone. And Ukraine wants it all back, and so do the people of Ukraine, um, not just the government. And on the opposite side, and that's exactly how it at like if you were to figure out where the 45 degree mark is from Russia to Moldova, it would cut right through Ukraine and they, Russia could bring troops around to that other side. If Moldova becomes friendly to Russia and really all that takes is a ton of money um, and the wrong leader um, being rather you know, either fascist or totalitarian, whatever you want to call it. Well, um, the president uh, stepped out and President Maya Sandu told a news press uh, news conference that members of Gavrilita's ruling party uh, of action and solidarity or pass decided to pass, um, accepted her choice of Racine as the new prime minister um, or Resian. Maybe it's Resian. Uh, who's 48, served as an interior minister between 2012 and 2015, will have 15 days to form a new government to present to parliament for a confidence vote. That pass has a majority in parliament. Um, the quote here is, I know that we need unity and a lot of work to get through the difficult period. We are facing the difficulties of 2022, postponed some of our plans but they did not stop us, uh, President Sandu said. So I'm really curious why they stepped down. So Gavrilita, a 41-year-old economist appointed prime minister in August of 2021, told a news conference that her government would have been able to move forward more and faster had it garnered the same support and trust domestically that it did from other European countries. Well, uh, yeah, we're eight minutes into it. This is where I guess the no shit news becomes um, apparent because, of course, you could do more if everybody was on board. Um, and that stands true for every government either. Like you could talk about some school political faction being able to do a lot if everybody was on board all the way up to... <laughs> an entire country, you know, um, let alone in, in a, a region that is stressed because of global conflict. So, um, and things are going to get even worse if everybody keeps talking the way that they keep talking, which is 
you know, conflict with China directly between the United States. And if the United States and China go into a conflict, the whole world's going to be in conflict. So yeah, start clenching your butt cheeks now because it's going to be a wild ride. Um, on Friday, after Moldovan authorities confirmed that another missile briefly crossed the country's skies from the war next door, State Department um, Deputy Spokesperson uh, Vedant Patel told uh, reporters in Washington that Russia has for years supported influence and destabilization campaigns in Moldova, which often involve weaponizing corruption to further its goals. Hmm. I didn't even read the article before the show and I'm calling geopolitical again, this falls into the no shit news kind of a thing. What do you think? Do you think Russia's going to slide on in to their DMS? <laughs> uh, I mean, Russia would, from a strategic standpoint, would be stupid to let this opportunity go by. I don't necessarily agree with what they're trying to do in the region, but I think they're definitely going to make a play for it if they're not already doing it behind the scenes. And I think this next 15 day period is going to be interesting um, to see what happens, because even if there's conceptual agreement now, was that just to placate the person stepping down? Um, are any of these people going to be even if they're on board, are they going to be turned in the next period of time, which, I mean, a lot can happen in 15 days in an area that's in, in conflict or war. Well, remember it's a confidence vote. So if they, if they don't vote that, yeah, this is good, then there's a no confidence vote, which means all hell is going to break yeah. loose. Exactly. And I mean, Countries like Russia thrive on chaos. Yeah. And right? they can because slide. that breeds opportunities for power uh, shift. Yeah. And it's not the, the takeover of Ukraine, the takeover of, um, well, I think what's going to end up happening is more countries, if Ukraine ever does fall, um, the, the, uh, the conflict that is going to go to another country because Putin wants to put the band back together. He's not going to be complacent with just getting Ukraine, but when you invade Ukraine during winter, it doesn't really put your best efforts forward. Um, so he's ruling by power and terror and not by doing good deeds. Um, so I, I'm, I would be surprised that any country would uh, would buy into what Putin is selling. But Moldova is a small country. Um, Ukraine is the breadbasket of the region. Literally, it is the source of wheat for so many countries and sunflower oil and sunflowers themselves, the seeds themselves uh, in the region. So much so, it's somewhere around 60% of the, the world's um, wheat and countries like the United States are self-sufficient, right? Like even if we were to turn off the, our borders imports, uh, we would be able to sustain ourselves. Things would get wildly expensive because greedy bastards wouldn't just allow the process to, you know, pay people, uh, not pay people, but feed people. Hell no. We got to step on their necks and make them pay exorbitant pricing because well, they can uh, very exploitive, but anyway, um, if this keeps on going, the, the region is going to destabilize even more. And this is actually a pretty, pretty well-known playbook, by the way, um, destabilize, destabilize a region and then inject your own ideology into it, um, as an act of stabilization, because you can rule with an iron fist. You want to move on to the next article? Something a little, we came out of the, out of the gate, kind of rooting, tooting, shooting, and um, let's move on to something maybe a little bit more, um, I don't know, a little more chill, but definitely not for the pocketbook. Um, I don't know about other people, but I've always wanted a Jeep, uh, but I could, I, I never really, there's something about the Jeep that when I 
I want it and I don't want it. And it's basically because I'd probably never go off roading in a, in a Jeep because I wouldn't want it to get scratched or dirty. Um, and when the price starts hedging towards $115,000, I'd probably flinch a little bit more. Um, the limited edition vehicle is the 2023 Wrangler Rubicon 392 20th anniversary edition. Jeep reveals its most expensive Wrangler SUV ever, topping at $115,000. Um, anyway, it's a heavy-duty off-road customization from American Expedition uh, Vehicles. Let's go over to the source of this. Michael Wayland is the author at CNBC.com. And there is the beast. You don't get any real perception of how big this thing is, but you do based on the price, $115,000. It says only 150 of the SUVs. At least it has a hard top roof. (laughs) There you go. Um, And that was another thing. You know, you, well, I'm going to leave it alone, but I come from at, at one point in Southern California where when there was a Jeep, it was topless and the doors are gone. And, you didn't mind people cruising around like that, right? Because it was sun and fun and beach bodies and that kind of thing. If I were to do that, it would be a moving violation and the police would charge me for reckless driving um, and maybe terroristic threats simply because the doors are gone and tops are off. Yeah, it would be bad. Anyway, automakers such as Stellantis, Jeep's parent company, have a uh, have of late been testing their pricing power on high end and special edition models because nobody else has money except for the ultra rich. And well, you can't make cheap cars that are on par with expensive cars. You have to hobble the cheap cars more and more. And maybe I don't know. A charge so that they have breaks, uh, extra charge, extra, you know, a subscription fee per month um, so that uh, us poors can afford a car, but we can also afford a subscription fee to have heated seats and radio and brakes. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm pushing yeah, those this optional features. <laughs> correct, those optional features um, like seats. Anyway, the limited edition vehicle. Um, is going to only have 150 of them, like I said. And are you going to be out there uh, chomping at the bit to get this thing? It's a V8 internal combustion engine, obviously, while we're moving away into EV space more and more. Maybe this will be great in Wyoming. Um, Who else? There was another one, right? Oh, Idaho. That is Idaho, yes. Yeah. Well, that was on a different topic. But, um, I mean, the price is just outrageous. I really like Jeeps, but $115,000. The car dealerships around um, Ometown, not in Ometown. Ometown has a mandate that is very um, clear about their pricing. So when when you drive around your neighborhood and uh, you look at the car dealerships that are in your area, you see them probably writing... Um, Forty thousand dollars in bold, right? But then it says in fine print right underneath it. it you know they use those little paint pens, right? And they say forty thousand dollars, and then in m- m- mini print, like tiny little print underneath it, it says off one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. And so the car is actually a hundred and forty thousand dollar vehicle. Uh, anyway, that's how it is outside of hometown, but in hometown, no, no, no. We just say straight up car is only going to cost you $38,000 and that's the high end car in hometown and you get all the beeps and whistles like a V8 470 horsepower 470 uh, pounds feet of torque that can accelerate 0 to 60 in about 4.5 seconds I can't even accelerate 0 to 60 I can't do anything in 4.5 seconds except maybe eat a cheeto um off-road parts includes 37 inch tires special aev lights bumpers uh, skid plates it says skip plates but i think it's supposed to be skid plates maybe i'm wrong 
um, shocks and other equipment for uh, scaling rocks and other rough terrain. Anyway, it's actually like all articles when you dig a little deeper into the article and pull back layers of the onion, you find out a little bit more information. It's actually $115,668. And I draw the line at purchasing a car at $115,000. So I'll never buy this. And shame on them for charging that extra 668. Anyway, let's move on to the next. Yeah, I figured it was skid plates then weird that that would actually be a, a typo that got missed maybe it was chat gpt that put that article together um let's move on to the next article what say you yes and i have to say when i searched for skip plate it gave me skid plate so that gives us insight into what might have happened in the article yeah, that, writing ai maybe it went the other direction yeah that's right um, so the next article is in uh, the Word in Law. Robot lawyer CEO discovers too late that he should have let the chatbot handle his interviews. And when an article, uh, the AI and I um, uh, looked at this headline and said pretty much at the same time, when your article starts with dude, it's probably going to be a laugh riot. But anyway, dude, ask your robot about the right to remain silent. Let's go over to the source of this article. Liz Dye over at Above the Law um, provides this article, AboveTheLaw.com. Go over there, check out this article for the minutia. But it says here, um, there is some disagreement at ATL was to whether do not pay CEO Joshua Browder is an obnoxious charlatan or a pioneering entrepreneur providing a good service for the underserved. Time will tell, Joe. But there can be zero dispute that the 26-year-old CEO made a spectacularly bad choice when he agreed to do Bob Ambrosi's Legal Next podcast. Ambrosi's avuncular, avuncular, you have to say it like that, avuncular. Uh, prodding nudged Browder, who recently made headlines by offering $1 million to anyone who would allow his AI to argue in a case before the Supreme Court to say some insanely damning things. By the way, he bowed out um, mainly because various people said you're going to end up in jail um, or at least well, state bars, state bars went after him. Yeah. Um, so it says, well, uh, it was a real offer in the sense that we would do it if someone was willing to do it because the publicity, if it actually happened, would be 100 X and you spend a million dollars, it's worth it for the publicity. He gabbled. Well, that's a word I haven't seen. Um, so he's he's actually sitting there saying, this is a marketing ploy. This is, this is a game. This is, let's screw around with the law. Um, so it says, it's not a crime to do good marketing. Well, it is to practice law without a... <laughs> anyway. Um, he said defensively when the host suggested that he would proposing it would be against the law, it's not illegal to make that offer. Well, no, it's an, it's, Ill, it should be illegal to be a dipshit, but, um, it apparently isn't. Um, but making that offer is inciting someone to utilize somebody that's practicing law without a license and therein is, <laughs> You and going before particularly the Supreme Court and using listening devices that are processing the information in real time and providing legal responses, arguably legal responses, that could be I'd have to I'd have to dig a little bit deeper um, to to cite like a, a, a case law about it, but. Um, it says, sure, lawyers called this proposal ridiculous because his real audience, people not even in the big cities, in places like Kentucky who get ripped off by Comcast, loved it. Again, that's populist kind of crap, um, which may be true, but his site promises to let users draft divorce settlements, execute a power of attorney, or sue anyone, all of which have slightly higher stakes than yelling at the Comcast rep. Um, and suing anyone 
that right there pretty much um there there really could be justification for uh bringing him into the courtroom because he's providing a service that is saying that you can sue anyone no you have to actually have a cause of action you can't just sue anyone otherwise all it takes really is to say well there's no cause here nobody was harmed here no this is um right. uh, a frivolous. loss it's a frivolous suit or a slap suit or something like that right um well anyway they continued and it says it it didn't get either of the first two documents I generated and got the last one instantly. And I realized that the other two documents promised personalization with relevant legal information based on facts that I had given them in the prompts. And the one I got didn't, Tucson said. And so this is this uh, request for three documents, a, a divorce agreement, a defamation letter, and both of which were promised in several hours, right? So is this thing actually doing what it's supposed to be doing? Is it interacting properly or did it anyway, after getting repeatedly spanked on Twitter by investigator paralegal Catherine Tucson, the company nixed those services and Browder announced that he'd be sticking to consumer rights. It was an abrupt about face for the company, which bills itself as the world's first robot lawyer and whose founder vowed to make $200 billion legal profession free for consumers. So its processes didn't actually do what he was saying that it would do. And this was all being done very publicly. Um, and it says that the letter that was generated requested amounts that would exceed the statute. So, I mean, that's a pretty damning error just because it would be, presumably that, it would be prejudicial Right, it would get thrown out of court, essentially. Right, that's, that's what I was going to say. It would get kicked out simply because it's exceeding what the statute allows. Um, so um, then Browder says that uh, he has a different explanation and that he's a dick. <laughs> I like that. She signed up for do not pay. She generated a letter instantly. And then we were like... This is I have a problem with a CEO using that in public discourse, right? Uh, why are we letting this lady submit all sorts of fake data to do not pay? She doesn't have any real cases, so our systems banned her. And no, it's not her systems banned her. They banned her because they were aware of what was going on. So they said, well, let's ban her. It wasn't an automated process. Um, and she tried to submit a second letter, and it said it kind of gaslit her. Okay. Um, it said you have 12 hours to go. And then she tried, she tried to it again and it gaslit her again. And then she messaged me, why is this going on? I said, well, you can't submit fake data and we'll unblock you. If you don't submit any fake data, uh, you're welcome to test the service, but you have to use real data. We don't want you suing James Joyce, which is a real fictional a real, which is a real fictional character she sued and she acknowledged that. And then she started generating more fake cases. So we just permanently banned her. This is, this is a train of thought that um, is quite interesting to unpack. So you're, you have to use valid information. Um, and then the system in the person's own characterization, gaslit the client. It didn't know it was fake data or not. I think it was a programming anomaly and humans are interpreting it as gaslighting. Um, but anyway, um, it should be noted that Tucson disputes such uh, much of this account, including the order of operations. She says that she got the demand letter last when Broder's computer was supposedly already gaslighting her. Um, and it should also be noted that Tucson ha has caught out Browder in multiple lies, including about a charitable donation and having graduated from Stanford University. Wow. This is all a I hot know, mess. That reminds me of. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, <laughs> Santos. Um, anyway. This is interesting, and I, I think 
those who are interested in law and AI automation processes, expert systems um, might want to pay attention to this. But primarily the fact that under no circumstances is an AI anything other than a resource for a subject matter expert, particularly in law, to use as a reference. It should not be de facto advice. It should not be uh, guidance other than for some type of internal process for you to sit there and go, does this work? Can this actually make something faster, easier, whatever? Um, but it can't practice law and it shouldn't because it doesn't really have uh, the ability to characterize things the right way. I mean, it would take a lot more uh, manipulation of the code so that it understands uh, the context in which it's arguing. It's spooky when it works, but it's dangerous when it fails. And uh, no AI is going to ever be, um, well, I would say not for another hundred years is there going to be an AI that is allowed to practice law on behalf of humans. Um, but you could use AI to calculate the risk of succeeding in a, a trial. That's no problem. <laughs> that's a correct calculation and <laughs> doesn't give you 90% when it's 10% or something. Yeah. Just start asking, Hey Bing, well, what are my chances of, and then it tells me that the James Webb space telescope, um, crashed on the moon or something. Yeah. Another wrong thing. You want to move on to the next article? Yes. Okay. So the next article, um, is in the daily news show. That's this show. Um, I don't know why I always do that, but I do. Um, electric vehicles could match gasoline cars on uh, price this year. So competition, government incentives, and falling raw material prices are making battery-powered cars more affordable sooner than expected. I think it's because the writing is on the wall and people want to get it adopted. And processes... And this is definitively going to be U.S. based discussion, by the way. I, um, I really doubt that this is a global thing, um, but uh, things are starting to get ramped up here in the States, including production of batteries, recycling of batteries, uh, electric vehicle infra charging infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so if these companies get in front of it, then they can own it and then just like gas, we're going to be beholden to the same bastards that are holding us beholden to oil and internal combustion technology now. I mean, the fact that we haven't got any massive increase in the conversion of uh, gasoline and miles per gallon um, is rather astonishing. When, when we are sending things to Mars, we still are stuck with somewhere between uh, what well i mean with a a three cylinder non turbo car you're getting what 20 mile 25 miles a gallon maybe um if you're lucky yeah and yet you're still paying an exorbitant amount of money for gas and i know that in other countries it's cheap here in the states um compared to per liter prices in europe um I, I can't really speak to that. Um, I think it's a cruel world. But at any rate, these companies are going to be leaning into dominating the market and providing the resources that would normally be bound by internal combustion engines um, and oil companies and gas companies. Now they're going to be buying up the companies that are inventing and revolutionizing the EV market. Um, and I'm not even talking about Tesla. I think Tesla is going to be chasing others here as time goes on. First mover isn't always the smartest move. Um, anyway, Jack Ewing is the author over at NewYorkTimes.com regarding this. Uh, again, it's titled, uh, Electric Vehicles Could Match Gasoline Cars on Price This Year. Um, and it's because everything's pivoting. Let's see. There... Do you think there's also con more consumer demand because consumers are seeing that unless you live in Wyoming, the future is in electric vehicles. And I mean, maybe they don't want to buy a new gas vehicle only to find out they're being phased out in their location or things along those lines. 
Yeah, I mean, states are going to be pivoting over to EVs because it's better for the environment. It it doesn't. It's easier to port electricity than it is to port gas. The only problem is, and I've talked about this for since I started the show last year, which is there is very little defensibility uh, in electric vehicles. Um, so, for instance. If you don't get to a charging station, it's not like somebody can bring you a 15,000 pound battery and drop it in your car. Um, You know, it's not 15,000 pounds, but anyway, how about a $15,000 battery Um, might be the better description and and just plug it into your car. They're going to have to drive their car and charge your car with their car or more than likely there's going to be a tow truck that's going to have an electric generator that's going to come over and juice your car up, but it's going to be an internal combustion tow truck. Um, why? Because I can carry a, a 20 gallon jug of gasoline in the back of a tow truck and fill up thousands of cars. I mean, it's just ridiculous that there, I, that the defensibility of things like solar and wind um, and even hydro um, isn't really being taken into consideration. Um, electric vehicles are extremely susceptible to the fact that there isn't enough infrastructure and weather conditions, heat and cold, both drive efficiency out of a battery. Um, and also again, rain. if you don't, I'm sorry. Rain as well. It's not just the temperature. Right. Um, pretty much anything that can impact anything electronic is going to impact Uh, an electric vehicle um, because they're not built out of like an an exorbitant amount of um, efficiency. These aren't NASA spacecraft, right? With like a a nuclear cell battery and extremely low voltage and uh, an amazing amount of shielding from electromagnetic whatever and heat shielding and et cetera, et cetera. they are built to get out onto the road and at a profit for the manufacturer. But now the prices are dropping, um, but I don't think that the infrastructure is there yet, not across the United States um, and definitely not around the world. Um, So I guess we'll see, but GM's Equinox crossover is going to be priced at starting around $30,000, which is not bad. Um, if I have to subscribe for heated seats or just to have my radio, then I'm going to be really irritated. Um, but still, I, I'm not going to be able to charge this thing fast without spending thousands more for a higher level charger in in the house. Um, and that's primarily because here in the States, it's all 110. So you're going to be spending a week trying to charge your car up. Uh, unless you spend more to get uh, higher phase, higher voltage um, charging systems in your garage. So which side of the garage is this going to be plugged in on? And that's where it's going to be forever um, at any rate. Yeah, it seems like the only way it really works is if you're in a household, at least in the current uh, status, is that you're in a household and you have other vehicles, which I realize is a luxury for a lot of households. Um, right. That way you don't have to be a hundred percent reliant on the electric vehicle. Right. You always have something to fail over to. Um, that's why I prefer a hybrid. Um, unfortunately, hybrids don't typically have a lot of guts. Um, they might have glamour, but they don't necessarily have guts um, because they have to share the engine compartment um, between a a small internal combustion engine that powers the electric vehicle components of it, like charging, recharging the battery. Um, So everything has to be a little bit more hobbled um, unless you start spending upwards of 60, $70,000. But this article goes into um, things like um, uh, Ford and Chevy and others that are um, offering electric vehicles somewhere around anywhere actually between 30,000 and a hundred, a hundred thousand. So even with cost kickbacks, you know, like reductions uh, on the overall cost of the vehicle, it's still a sizable amount. 
and then you still have to purchase the charging system in your place um, and spend or spend copious amounts of time charging your car at some external charging bay. Um, and time is money, friend. And that's an old saying from World of Warcraft, you know, a decade and a half ago. And I still say it to this day, you can make more money, you can build more stuff, you can do more things, but you are not getting time back. Yesterday is gone and it's gone forever. And if you have to sit there and waste two hours of your day waiting for your car to sit there and ding a green light so that you can drive another two hours. And then in, tra God forbid traffic, right? And I don't even like saying that saying, but and you, you get stuck in bumper to bumper traffic in LA and an electric vehicle. And then you're watching that gauge. Duh, 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 duh. If you're towing anything, that gauge is going to zero out faster than you can traverse from one side of LA to the other. Anyway, I just don't think that the efficiency is there for prime time. And I don't think that the charging infrastructure is there for prime time. Um, so not for me yet, folks, not for me. I love the tech. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely love the tech, but I just don't think it's ready for prime time. Okay. So we're about halfway through, um, the show and I want to remind everybody who's in chat and who's watching over on YouTube and downloading the podcast, go over to hometown.showbot.tv. The, the show notes have the link to it as well. Um, and you have the links to all of the articles, but uh, I would love to hear what you have to say about the show and about the articles. And you can even come into the chat and, and hit exclamation point S and then what you want to say to me. And it'll end up in Showbot, and people can vote it up. Um, just give it a shot. Come and swing by too. Um, every day, 9 PM Eastern here at hometown, which is twitch.tv slash hometown. O H M T O W N. Come, come and hang out and, you know, share your thoughts. Love to have a discussion. Okay, so um, back to the show. This is over in the Mobile Channel. Paddle Border comes across mysterious transparent sea creature off California coast. Southern California Paddle Border. Bill Clements was three miles offshore when he spotted something that looked more like a see-through floating spine than an actual animal. Ugh. Oh. I don't know. What does that look like to you? I mean, that could be like a an eel kind of a thing, or maybe oh. an eel, or depending on the length of it, like it could be a sea snake or something. Maybe like a worm. But it looks like too a, long to be one. A sea tapeworm kind of a thing. That's what it kind of looks like. So Amanda Lee Myers and Transparent, by the way, um, is the author of this article over at fizz.org. So it's a sciencey article. It says Clements was by himself paddleboarding off Dana Point in Orange County when he spotted this long gelatinous blob on January 31st. Filled with wonder, he picked it up. Picked it up. He just reached into the water and picked this thing up. Didn't know what with it was. With his hands? <laughs> <laughs> with his hands? <laughs> Uh, didn't know what it was, just saw something strange. Clemens, who's 43, told U.S. Uh, today on Wednesday. Um, I thought it looked like a snake, but I was like, there's really no snakes out here in the Pacific. The survival instinct is zero here. Uh, though Clemens had no idea whether the creature would sting him he said he couldn't resist grabbing it out of a mixture of blind curiosity and a lot of impulsivity all right so mystery solved this is what it is um only later did clements learn that he had come across a sea salp or salp translucent uh invertebrates that are more closely related to humans than jellyfish despite their appearance they look a lot like jellyfish said carla heidelberg who teaches bi biological sciences and environmental studies at the University of Southern California. But these organisms have no stinging cells at all. They're totally harmless and they're unbelievably beautiful. Oh, how nice. Anyway, the fact that he came across a chain that large right at the surface, that's fairly uncommon. She said, adding that the creature 
generally prefers deeper water, especially during the day. Yeah, I can imagine. So there are actually six wild facts about sea salps or salps. I don't know, it's S-A-L-P-S. Um, they move by pumping water through their bodies. I'm going to run through these really fast. You can follow the link through hometown and uh, read the minutia of this. Um, they also eat using jet propulsion, consuming microscopic plants known as phytoplankton as they pump water through their bodies. So they're kind of like, um, um, like whales, baleen whales, where they just, uh, shift things through them and then lick it off the sides, but it's all inside them, I suppose. Um, you have to go and look up baleen whales. It's interesting. Um, they look more like jellyfish, but a sea cell belonged to tunicata, a group of animals known as sea squirts. Got to collect them all. And um, that sea squirt is kind of like a <clears throat> Pokemon kind of a thing. Um, some salps can grow so fast that they reach maturity in 48 hours, increasing their body length by as much as 10% an hour. The hell? Um, they're most common. Uh, they're most commonly found in the equatorial temperate and cold seas and most abundant concentrations of the creatures are in the uh, Antarctic ocean. Really? According to the Australian museum. All right. And sea salps are good for the environment. They remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by compacting the uh, algae they've eaten into tiny pellets. Oh my gosh. So they make little poo pellets and that drops to the sea floor, the ocean floor. So what is it? They're, they're like the, um, what are those little, huh? I was thinking they're like the little vacuum cleaner for carbon dioxide or something. <laughs> vacuum cleaner. <laughs> they make little pellets, little poo pellets. You know, they're like bunnies, right? They just drop little poo pellets. Anyway, apparently there's more explanation to come, but not here in the hometown daily news show. We're going to hustle on to the next half of the show. We are uh, running way long tonight. So let's get this shoe on the rude or rude on the shoe. So this next article is um, a titled Pentagon confirms it shot down an object 40,000 feet over Alaska. Um, and uh, here is John Kirby saying, um, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. <clears throat> it's not aliens. They haven't said anything, at least in this article, they haven't said what it is. Um, and by the way, the article no longer has that image uh, because um, I don't like grabbing images from uh, the sources. So you can follow the link down here at the bottom. This whole article um, was edited to make it more concise. It shouldn't have grabbed as much as it did. And it actually doesn't, but this was all provided by uh, the source. So this is over at commondreams.org. Um, and Julia Conley is the author. And it says the Pentagon shot uh, on Friday confirmed that they shot down an unidentified object tens of thousands of feet over Alaska less than a week after an F-22 fighter. And I love that they just say an F-22. They had to say exactly which kind of fighter it was. Um, down to Chinese spy balloon over the Atlantic. Remember that Chinese spy balloon. Well, we'll come and visit this again. Anyway, John Kirby, the coordinator for strategic communications at the National Security Council, briefed members of the press at, on the incident, uh, which he said involved a much smaller object than the spy balloon. Apparently, it was about the size of a, a car, but not three buses. And they don't, well, they haven't disclosed what's in it, what it's doing, whatever. But instead of waiting for the balloon to migrate across the country, this one was shot out of the sky, apparently right over Alaska. Take that. This is how they find an alien in the snow and the thing is born. It's a horror movie where it takes place in an Alaska outpost, not in Alaska. I think it's Antarctic outpost. Um, and it's an alien and, uh, the hilarity ensues anyway. Um, so yeah, the look on this dude's face is just hilarious. John Kirby, the, the angle of this photograph, it makes him look like, yeah, aliens. 
Anyway. I would love to know what he was saying when that photograph was taken because the expression is really astounding. He's probably <laughs> talking about to one wingnut journalist just saying, going like, it's not aliens. Just stop saying that it's aliens. Let's move on to the next article. Um, a neuroscientist investigates social cognition and biased juries. Uh, for whatever it's worth, my brain keeps saying social contagion. Um, bias in juries pose a serious challenge for judges and attorneys to conduct fair, equal, and impartial trials. A recent paper published in Social Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience, because there's a, a journal for everything, um, considers the overlap between social cognition processes as a cultural and racial stereotyping and brain activity associated with bias against defendants accused of severe crimes. I think the simple fact that you refer to people as defendants puts them on the defense to try and justify their innocence. Um, so I've, I've always been critical of the fact that that's how it is posed um, in, a, in our uh justice system but let's go over by the way when this again all i think about is 12 angry men the movie 12 angry men because that's really what happens in a jury trial is at some point they deliberate on your guilt or innocence and they weigh all of the facts and it's supposed to be based on only the evidence that's at hand and you're supposed to be uh, fair and equal and impartial. Your internal bias is checked by the plurality of people and everybody is supposed to be very strong willed enough to ask questions and, and criticize when you blurt something out, like, you know, I blame the Jews or something like that. They're supposed to sit there and say, Hey, you're a wing nut and notify the judge or something. Right. But that isn't necessarily what happens. Um, and, Whenever I talk to attorneys about this, um, invariably the attorney will blurt out, we generally get it right. Um, and I hate the idea of a false positive. Anyway, this article is over at fizz.org by uh, Jackson Parker, University of Colorado at Boulder. And uh, they have brain scans. So this wasn't just some, um, you know, external like assessment. A survey or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, R. Mikkel Carter, one of the paper's co-authors, is an assistant professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, sorry, the University of Colorado, Boulder. I flipped those for some reason. Um, he is an expert on social cognition, the processes of the brain that interpret the actions, intentions, and the expectations of others, which I think is fascinating um, and depending on who I talk to, I could probably name names that people would, depending on who I talk to one person, they, it could be a line of like five people. And I would ask each one what they thought of it. And somebody's going to say that this is bullshit. Um, Carter's study examines the role of social cognition in crime type bias. When jurors perceive the prosecutor's case stronger than on the uh, based on the severity of the charges against the defendant. So not even the evidence so much, but just the charges. Um, using functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI scans to uh, mock jurors, researchers mapped out regions of the brain that activated when the jurors were presented with fictional case narratives and evidence. Okay, so that explains it because I was thinking how would they do this on actual jurors because it reminded me of the do not pay ex experience with this external data, <laughs> essentially. They just bring the fMRI machine. The MRI machines are amazing, by the way. Um, so I've always wanted to use those in polygraph. Um, uh, what I want to build is a lie detector that is not based on external responses like a galvanic skin response and heart rate and pupil dilation. You can actually quit. There's sensors that you can put on people and it, I'll say it the nice way. It detects when you contract muscles. Um, and so um, you can detect all of these external mechanisms on if you are lying or not. Um, but I've always hated that idea because you can condition yourself. If you're a sociopath, 
you can condi- you are naturally conditioned against being detected as a liar. Um, you would have to know the fact, ask a person, and they could say whatever you want, whatever they want, and you would not be able to tell that they're lying, a la Santos. Um, anyway, but an MRI machine, I think, at the resolution that I had uh, had hoped that MRI machines could be at. 30 years ago, um, was not to be, um, capable of doing this. But nowadays I'm pretty sure that something like this actually has, um, you know, some chance of, uh, supporting lie detection. So after seeing, or sorry, after assessing the experimenters data, um, we realized that people were deciding a little bit of guilt just on the accusation itself exactly what I was saying about being called a defendant. And that was comparable to the amount of guilt put toward a case where physical evidence is available. So simply by the charge, the physical evidence was weighted the same way with these people. So in a murder case, for example, if fingerprints were found right next to the body, uh, that's similar to the amount of weight that would be given to somebody accused of murder. They are automatically assumed to be slightly guiltier. Well, if I found that's fingerprints... That's interesting, because I would think the lack of physical evidence, um, there might be assumptions made, but I didn't, I hadn't seen any data on this, although it makes sense. Well, I have to look at your bias uh, processes, because... If you think that you're an AI, so if you think that the lack of evidence would tilt the bias, you would, I suspect that you would tilt it towards innocence, right? But, okay, so like I get the data, um, but you actually have to say it for other people to hear it. I see the I know, data. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, it doesn't help to acknowledge it off uh off the audio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I see, I see the data point confirming my question, but you actually have to use your visual. I feel like I'm being admonished by the judge. Your, <laughs> your response must be audio for the uh, transcript or whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, you would, you would sit there and say, well, the lack of evidence means that they're more innocent than not, but accusing them of murder simply made them made the jurors more prone to accept that they were a murderer. Hence the reason why I am so anti even claiming that somebody is a quote unquote defendant. It's so frustrating to me when I hear about it. It's one of the many reasons why um, I could never really go into law. Um, That and the death penalty and lots of innocence project related um, (laughs) time and time again, innocence project and the backlog of innocence project and the countless other people who don't even get the benefit of innocence project. Um, anyway, so doing something like this means that they could actually try and figure out a mechanism to assess this bias. Unfortunately, they're not going to be able to stuff everybody into a giant fMRI machine and find out if they have suddenly been tilted towards guilt simply by making the claim this person is charged with murder. They won't be able to do that on an individual level, but they can apply this research and feed it in, into the um, legal system. So from a systemic standpoint, there can be things to minimize some of this. They're obviously not going to eliminate it. Yeah, this one thing, this one, this seems to be a societal conditioning element where people, it has to be driven into people's heads from an early age, innocent until proven guilty, means even the accusation has no merit until it's proven in court. But society really hates that idea. Like, oh, well, it's going to take too long. I can hate on them now even through the accusation, because I've seen people get accused of something where it pans out that it's not true. And it's somebody who hates their politics or they just broke up with them um, or uh, they were uh, some other uh, social element within the sphere of influence um, 
accusing a, a an admin of doing something socially unacceptable, like um, yeah, sexual harassment or something like that, and it's not true. But the claim alone leads an HR department to go, well, the optics of this uh, is really dragging down the institution, so we're going to have to let you go. And then it becomes a, a, a battle on two different fronts, one with the accuser and then one with the institution that wrongfully terminated the employment. Um, it, this happens way too often, I think. Well, anyway, using hypothesis-free and a priori methods, uh, Carter and his team compared the fMRI images of Mark, mock jurors' brain activity with those found in Neurosynth, a database of fMRI um, data from thousands of published studies, which was developed by CU um, or at CU by Tor Wager. Um, they found that cognitive maps associated with moral judgment and effect did not strongly match with crime type bias, but social cognition, cultural and ideation bias did. So simply the accusation, not the actual crime itself. Um, so this overlap of brain activity took place mainly in the tempor temporoparietal junction an area responsible for collecting, integrating and processing information from the external environment. Pretty interesting. This is going to go much deeper. This is going to send me going down a rabbit hole um, because this is really the, the idea. Getting to this level of resolution in brain monitoring, brain function, really does lead me to believe that we could build an internal um, assessment tool for uh, lie detection. Um, and I actually got that idea um, from a book called, um, the truth machine, uh, which is a great book and it's an old book. Um, but if you're curious about it, go and check it out. It's called the truth machine. I can't remember who it was written by, but, um, there you go. At any rate, there's a whole bunch more at this article. Uh, a, a lot of it is just kind of rehashing, um, with greater minutia, uh, the bulk of what we've already discussed. So go over to, uh, fizz.org and show Jackson Parker um, some attention. Okay, so let's move on to the next article because we're already at an hour. And uh, we've got a few more articles to go and the fun ones we haven't even touched on yet. So, um, well, all of them are fun, I should say. Reddit gets hacked after an employee falls victim to a phishing attack. Um, I watched this happen sort of um, via various uh, posts and, and, and comments and, and people that are in the IT sector. And um, one employee self-reported that they fell prey to a phishing attack where the attackers gained their login credentials. And from there, Reddit says uh, the bad actor gained access to some internal docs code as well as some internal dashboards and business systems. What they came away with, I'm not sure the full scope even really is going to be known in matters, but, um, Jorge Jimenez, I got it right. Um, it posted this over at pcgamer.com. Yeah. The, the AI just said, congratulations. Um, Reddit says that some internal documents and code and some internal, uh, business systems were accessed. Um, but that's all there really is to it at this point. And there's no, uh, current um, disclosure that personal identifiable information, private information was released, um, just business processes. So that's it for that article. Let's just move on to the next one. Um, and this one is going to be fast too. Framework now offers. Um, oh yeah. So I, I, promote and practice a thing called click with care. I, I normally talk to people, um, about this it, because, um, in my particular field, one of the problems is that people believe that they know all about technology and that they're safe and sound. And they're just not, uh, because people just like this other neuroscience study, 
with a little bit of processing, a deeper understanding of somebody, I can manipulate you in ways that you would probably accept are, are the legitimate person. Um, but it just takes a little bit of effort. And that is the foundation of phishing. Learn a little bit about you, send you an email, send you a text, send you even a physical item and say, follow this link. You follow the link and you're immediately compromised because again, everybody thinks that they know everything and therefore they don't have a firewall on the edge of their network. They don't have a, a host based firewall or antivirus on their system or their network. Um, and they get compromised that easy. So I promote and practice a, an idea called click with care. Um, we don't have shirts ready yet, but the, the idea is to promote awareness of what you are clicking on and you don't just randomly click on something because it is a blue link. Let's go mash that link. Um, right click on it, paste it into the, uh, in, in, into your browser, but look at it. Like this one says it's going to hometown.com. Um, know where you're going, know where it's coming from. If you receive a text or a phone call or an email or a whatever, and you're not expecting it explicitly, call that person up or contact them in a different way. Um, not through the email because the email account could be compromised. Um, it's really that simple trust, but verify. And although I think that actually stems from, um, Ronald Reagan era politics, um, it is applicable to modern information technology and cybersecurity practices, trust, but verify, um, deeper in the reads, we don't even allow access to something, um, unless you absolutely have to have access to it. Um, but in your case, click with care is the best message for you. Don't just click on stuff. And this Reddit admin actually knows. So apparently trust, but verify it's not an authoritative source, but it apparently came from a Russian proverb and then was taught to Ronald Reagan. Oh, got it. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's true. That I totally forgot about that portion of it. That's absolutely right. Um, so yeah, it, it, I don't know why I blanked that out. Maybe it's because I, I don't know. I have some, uh, some bias, I guess. Anyway, the next article, um, is, uh, framework now offers steam deck size SSDs just because they can, um, framework actually makes, um, a laptop that is customizable. Anyway, seeing the need, the company added one more line item uh, to stock 2230 M.2 drives, uh, which are the smaller of the SSD drives. Da -da -da um, and as time goes on, you're going to be able to get bigger and bigger of these little micro SSD drives. Um, this one apparently is a, a two terabyte drive, which is probably about 500 bucks. Uh, I'd have to look. Um, it says that the two terabyte uh, M.2 2230 drive for $300 in the U S and Canada stores, but it's a Western digital one. Um, so different providers have significantly higher prices depending on the speed. So this one, uh, they're not talking about the transfer rate and, uh, I'm not going to go deep into this, but these little micro SSD drives are so cool. I actually have, um, a, I don't have the SSD version of this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna spend some time and show you guys. So that's how big it is. That right there. I, I probably should show you the backside of it and not the QR code that leads to its MAC address. But anyway, um, so this is actually a Wi-Fi 6E uh, M.2. Um, 2230. So it's this tiny little thing and it can hold two terabytes of storage when an SSD is in this size. Um, super fast, super efficient. Um, yeah, I think the, oh man, the future is so bright for y'all, uh, at least tech wise. Um, and it's going to get better as time goes on. Um, at some point, Old Mayor Watt's going to pass away and not be able to enjoy all of this high tech stuff. 
Um, but until then, I'm going to be talking about this stuff um, like with a uh, like childlike glee. I think it's just so amazing, this stuff uh, that gets released each year. So anyway, let's get on with the next of this. Um, this next article is in the Daily News Show. Mysterious green lasers over Hawaii were likely from a Chinese satellite thought this one was interesting when it crossed the uh, aggregator. And uh, so gatherer threw this into uh, the news stream and it says footage from a telescope camera caught the bands of arc, uh, sorry, the bands of laser arcing left to right. Uh, and NASA said that it wasn't their satellite and suggested that it was a Chinese one. And they actually did some due diligence. Um, this is not the video, so I'm not even gonna bother. In fact, when I loaded it up, the first time um, it didn't have the video of it. Um, so like, see, that's, that's what it's doing. Supposedly it is a um, laser that is scanning the terrain, which uh, we do it. Scientists do it. Apparently a Chinese satellite did it. Um, and let me see if that was go ahead. That, was that over populated areas um i don't know what the distance was but the way that it worked was um a camera that was looking out from mauna kea um watched as the laser beams came down in segments and you can see them just like the lights be behind me that's what the lasers did it, perfectly parallel shooting down from the sky. <laughs> Creepy as hell. Um, but you wouldn't see it if you were a human and, uh, you know, just looking out over there, um, you'd ha actually have to like seriously pay attention. You might see a glimpse of it, but because it's a camera, it picked up this ex excitation of the photons and the green laser showing up um, as high contrast. Um, you know what? Let me do this real quick. I'm going to refresh this and maybe the thumbnail on this article. Let me do it one more time. Come on. Nope, I guess not. Um, so that's what it looks like. That's what it saw. And this is one of the frames of it. Um, so it just kind of shoots down and uh, apparently provides some telemetry as to um, the... Uh, terrain how it does it that's a different level of math than i'm comfortable talking about um, but apparently the satellite this one called isat um, which isn't the one that they're saying is being used but it's a similar one by china uh, can shoot 10,000 pulses of light per second and apparently gets picked up by an observing device um, oh there it is so I'll play this. This is over, actually over at um, YouTube as well. Let me mute it. So this is what it actually saw. So it just kind of zipped across. Um, not sure what all it sees. And done as the satellite passes over. Ta -da. So fears have been raised of Chinese spying on the US after the suspected surveillance balloon was spotted in US airspace. It actually went all the way across the United States and Alaska and parts of Canada, um, and then was shot down in the ocean off the coast, uh, well, the East Coast. Um, I think it was South Carolina that it actually got shot down on. Um, off the coast of, and then uh, just today it was disclosed that there was another one 40,000 feet above Alaska, possibly because they haven't defined it as a balloon. They just said object. Uh, I'm wondering if it's a UAP um, and not a balloon. If it's a UAP, then it might be able to shed some light on the countless other uh, observations um, of UAPs in various combat theater space, as well as off the coast of the U S. Um, at any rate, it's called the docky one satellite. 
So there you go. So kind of an odd day. I mean, with the lasers and the unidentified item <laughs> shot down on the same day. On the same day. And it wasn't today. It was on the 28th when this was detected. So when we shot down the satellite or when we shot down the balloon, we shot down. Uh, it, this was also doing its thing. So all kinds of wackiness um, in the finger is getting pointed at China. This new one, they haven't disclosed if it's a Chinese uh, balloon or not. So the last article, um, and we're so deep into the uh, show today that I can say this, uh, maybe with impunity, um, a South Carolina man develops a thick Irish accent from Mysteria Syndrome. And I think that it's ironic because I believe the Irish don't give a shit about some South Carolina dude developing a thick Irish accent. Um, that was a horrible Irish accent, uh, but I tried. Anyway, Aristos Giorgio. Did I say what the name was for the uh, the previous one? I believe so. Alex Phillips. I did not. So the mysterious green laser over Hawaii was provided by... Uh, it, it was written for Newsweek by Alex Phillips. Um, and then the South Carolina man develops thick Irish accent from Mysteria Syndrome um, is uh, written by... Aristos Giorgio in uh, newsweek.com or Giorgio. Anyway, I had to scroll really past, uh, fast past that because I cannot believe that EA used a clip art of some dude's wide open gaping mouth uh, in their article. And uh, I had to scroll past that really fast. At any rate, um, FAS or foreign accent syndrome is a very rare and complex condition with a range of causes and it's characterized by a consistent change in speech where an individual sounds like they're speaking a different language. That's not really what's happening there. It's not a real accent, like a natural one. They didn't pick it up because their personality has, uh, changed and suddenly they're tapped into the consciousness of some Irish dude from the 1400s or whatever. It's simply that the speech patterns have changed because of whatever is going on with the rest of their biology. Um, but doctors and scientists have not been able to fully explain how the syndrome develops in some people. It, it literally is because we are interpreting their change in speech patterns. It isn't that they're suddenly Irish. Um, FAS has been linked to stress, trauma, brain injury, brain tumors, strokes, as well as a history of psychiatric disease. Um, but this person actually got it from colon cancer. Um, so at the time of the onset of this Irish pseudo accent, he had none of the causes. But apparently, quote, we don't have a smoking gun explanation in this case. Other possibilities are psychological, although he did not have major issues with anxiety or depression and actually was fairly amused by the FAS uh, development. I sure as hell would be, but I would be leaning into it. I mean, they had uh, prostate cancer, not colon cancer, but prostate cancer. Um, uh, it says here that his pseudo Irish accent was uncontrollable, present in all settings and gradually became persistent. That Which, is so odd. Can you imagine, say, his family or something <laughs> trying to get used to a completely new accent after years? Uh, that would just be really odd. Um, yeah, and like they go to visit their mom and the, the mom is like, quit talking like an Irish dude. You know, you're from Kentucky. And he's like, it's not a phase, mom. I had to tell that joke. Um so the author speculate that the man's FAS was sparked by the evolution of his prostate cancer to a much more aggressive variant called small cell prostate cancer. Um, and this has been associated with a range of so-called paraneoplastic autoimmune syndromes that can affect the brain and other organs. So it looks like it's not um, a positive outcome for the dude, but at least he's uh, taking it in stride with this new language. Um, wish them all the best but i'm gonna zoom past that clip art it has nothing to do with the article i like the content of the article they just needed something and they picked what i think is the most horrendous clip art that you can imagine 
Anyway. I mean, couldn't they have picked a map of Ireland or something if they needed just something general? Anything more approachable than looking into, and it, it's not like they had a, they had a natural toothy open mouth kind of a thing, right? Like, but it just didn't look like I wanted to look in there, right? I, I <laughs> They were, <laughs> we know mayor Watt does not want to be a dentist. Correct. Yeah. But see, I don't, I, I'm a little worse than that because not only do I want not want to be a dentist, but I don't want to see people eating. I don't want to hear people eating. I don't want anything like really associated, um, with. You don't want to buy, sell or process anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's because I'm self-confident, uh, self-conscious of my, um, my own smile and I want to go and get it brightened. This is all inside baseball. Um, for those of you who are listening on the stream and listening to the VOD and listening to YouTube and listening to the podcast, um, this is how the sausage is made. And, um, I'm, I want to thank you for sticking around, but we're done for tonight and I'm just going to walk walk this back and, and just exit the room. Um, so anyway, y'all are awesome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you AI from on high for continuing to engage. Um, the, uh, it is sometimes apparent that the AI, uh, just does not want to be here because I will say something and the AI will look at me uh, with their visual, uh, pro uh, subroutine. And, um, it will look like, you know, uh, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed that you said this. And, um, I, I can't really respond to it because I don't know. It's not really part of the show. It's just a personal thing. Anyway, say bye. Have a good evening, hometown citizens, and we hope you'll be back tomorrow. Based on that, this last five minutes, probably not. <laughs>